The sacred scriptures we're going to consider this evening is from the fourth book of Kings, chapter 2. Or in some modern Bibles, it's, it's the second book of Kings, chapter 2. Verses 6 to 13. Elias took his mantle and folded it together and struck the waters. And they were divided hither and thither. And they both passed over on dry ground. Elias said to Eliseus, Ask what thou wilt have me to do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Eliseo said, I beseech thee that in me may be thy double spirit. And he answered, Thou hast asked a hard thing, but if thou see me when I am taken from thee, Thou shalt have what thou hast asked for. And the chariot carried Elias away alive. And Eliseo saw him as he was carried away. And he took up his, the mantle of Elias that fell from him. This reflection we're going to dedicate to the most holy Blessed Virgin Mary, the mother of Jesus, the mother of God, our mother, truly and really our mother. And she lives. She's alive, not just with her soul, but also her body. And she is so holy and she is so beautiful that we should contemplate her and if we see and we reflect on her great beauty, so much fruit is going to emerge from our hearts. Because remember, yesterday we meditated on heaven. And we know that it's a narrow gate to get to heaven. Heaven is not easy to enter. It's first of all, it's a gift. And we also have to fight in order to get to heaven. But what better way to guarantee for us the easy passage toward heaven, than to be devoted to the mother of Jesus, to love the mother of Jesus. Just imagine, for example, her merits. As you know, as baptized Christians, whatever good that we do, we increase our merit. That is, our good works united to grace causes a, a certain level of glory and privilege and perfection that can be achieved. These are called merits by what we earn by our good works united to grace. Imagine the Blessed Virgin's merits. They are infinite almost. There are so many merits that she has. And because that she is the mother of God and she's sinless, she never sinned never had the original sin, and she never committed an actual sin. The purest of all virgins, the most pleasing creature in the eyes of God. Now watch what St. Louis de Moffat, I'm going to quote for him often during this speech, during this talk. St. Louis de Moffat, he had the true devotion to the Blessed Virgin, and he said this about the Blessed Virgin. He said that, if she, the Blessed Virgin, with just one stitch of sewing, she took a thread and a needle, and she just does one single stitch on a, on a, piece, of cloth, a piece of cloth. He said, just that one action would be more pleasing to God. She'll gain more merits by just that one stitch then all of the martyrs combine, shedding all of their blood for Christ and for the church. The hundreds of thousands of martyrs that have shed their blood for Christ, just by the Blessed Virgin, by just putting one fork on the table, because St. Joseph is going to eat, just putting one fork 
will be more pleasing, would, would please God much more than all the angels and all the saints together or whatever they can possibly ever do to try to please God. That is how powerful and holy she is. There is no creature on earth that will ever match the supreme holiness of the Blessed Virgin. St. Louis de Montfort says it'll be easier to take the light out of the sun, the sun, the solar sun, than to try to take separate Mary from Jesus. It'll be easier for us to take the, the fire off of the sun. And so what type of attitude should we have? We should have that of total and absolute confidence. Never become scrupulous about, oh, I'm paying too much attention to the Blessed Virgin. We can never satisfy our, our thirst for pleasing the Blessed Virgin, to loving her and recognizing God's great marvels within her. St. Louis de Montfort says that we should be like a little pebble in the midst of an ocean. That's how we should be in the hands of the Blessed Virgin. We should be so lost in her. Have you ever tried to find a pebble in the ocean? Here you're flying over the Atlantic Ocean. You're flying to Europe. And you just throw a little pebble out. Okay, I'm going to come back 10 years to find that pebble in the ocean. (laughs) Good luck. I think only the Holy Trinity will be able to find that pebble. Imagine us in the hands of Mary. Once we're there, we have nothing to worry about, nothing to fret. We have no reason to despair. She is our hope. She's our confidence. She is our mother, our mother. Do we not feel this even? Do we not know this? St. Louis de Montfort also says, I think he's quoting St. Ambrose in his book, True Devotion. Listen to this. This will shock you. That which God is by nature, what do we know, what do we know about his nature? He's omnipotent. He's eternal. He's all powerful, all knowing, can do all things. We know everything that God is, right? <laughs> And St. Louis de Montfort, quoting St. Ambrose, says, that that which God is by nature, Mary has by grace. Think about that for a few minutes. That'll boggle our minds. That what God is by nature, what he is, she has, she's been received by grace. God fills her so profoundly. That when we say Mary, she says God. Everything is God. And we have to have that conviction because a lot of our separated brethren in the, the Protestant religions, they will, they will try to do everything imaginable to downplay her. And they think that we're too exaggerated because we have the great love for the Blessed Virgin Mary. But St. Louis de Montfort says, no, don't do that. Every time we praise the blessed, we cannot praise her enough. We cannot love her enough. And every time we praise her, every time we love her, God is so pleased. Because that is the channel by which God comes to us. It was through her fiat, her yes. That's the only access we have to God. It's only through her when she said yes. And so every time we, we render her homage, no matter how heartfeltly it is, how lovable it is, God is very pleased by that. And St. Louis de Montfort said, 
St. Louis de Montfort says that it is a sure sign of predestination, the devotion that we have to the Blessed Virgin. Because you see, our Protestant brothers, they don't understand that in Catholic theology we, we make distinctions. There is worship latria and there's worship dulia. So worship latria is only the type of worship we give only to God. Of course, God is infinitely more holy than the Blessed Virgin, of course. I mean, God is infinitely and that's why we, we dedicate to him a, a latria type of worship. But with the Blessed Virgin, we render her a super hyperdulia, another type of worship of a greatest veneration. And then the saints, we just give them dulia. <laughs> so the Blessed Virgin, hyperdulia and, and all of this. So our, our Protestant brothers don't know what they're talking about. Just if you would know some stuff about theology and about philosophy, you'll be able to make distinctions. All they see is just the word worship, and they, they freak out. You know? <laughs> so don't let them do that to you. You know what's better. You know it's what. How can we show disrespect to the mother of Jesus? That's an impossibility for me. We must be so dedicated to the Blessed Virgin. And she is the queen of the universe. She is queen. Do you remember on the day of the glorious ascension to heaven, when Jesus ascended to heaven on Thursday, 40 days after the resurrection? Our Lord Jesus said, All power has been given over to me, both in heaven and on earth, all power. And you know that the Blessed Virgin participates in that power. She is a queen, and all jurisdiction falls under her hands. The Blessed Virgin. And as we know, Many times we like to go to mommy instead of daddy. Because, <laughs> you know, daddy's a little rough sometimes, right? So we go to mommy because we know she has a soft spot. Like all women, they have a, such a, a softness. And we can go to the Blessed Virgin. But you want me to tell you what the secret is in order to have access to the crown of the Blessed Virgin? Here's a secret. Shh. The secret is you be willing to go with her to Egypt. And all what that means, she had to go in a full, spur of the moment. She had to go learn hieroglyphics, a language she didn't know. She didn't know when she was coming back. She didn't know what was over there. And as she was running off to Egypt with Joseph, she's hearing all of the stabbings of all those babies because of her, that she was there in Bethlehem with her child that now she's escaping. And because she had her child there, all of those babies and all those men, many men and also women, died a brutal death. Could you imagine the sadness of the heart of the Blessed Virgin? And so if you want access to the crown, where the Blessed Virgin works miracles and marvels in your family, in your life, in your society, in your country, in your nation, in your world, be willing to put lots of miles, or as you say here in Canada, kilometers, on your car going to Egypt with her and experiencing the same sufferings that she suffered. That's the surest way 
of remaining humble and truly asking for what we really need in our lives. St. Louis de Moffat in his other little book called The Secret of Mary speaks about a little story of a peasant that wanted to thank his king. And so he says, what am I going to gift the king with to show him that I'm grateful? I know what. I'm going to give him an apple. <laughs> so he put an apple on a plate, but the apple was half rotten. So he walks up the aisle to the king and he shows the king, he says, your majesty, please accept this from a humble peasant that is so grateful for you, for your services to us and thy protection for us. And the king looks at the apple, this, and slaps the apple out of his, out of his hand and rebukes him and sends him out. And so the peasant is so distraught, he walks off hurt, didn't understand why he was rejected, his little gift. <laughs> and he goes off and he sits down in front of the palace door. And then a queen walks by the queen. She walks by and she sees the little peasant sniffling and crying. And so the queen comes up to him and says, My child, what's wrong with you? The king didn't want to accept my apple. Let me see that apple. Here it is. Oh, I know why. <laughs> and so she takes out a golden platter. And she takes the apple with her own hands. That apple. The soul of that peasant. His gift. And she shaves off all the rotten parts of the apple. And she cuts it in fine, uh, measured little pieces and puts them beautifully upon the golden plate. And then she puts little flowers all along the platter. And then she says, come, my child, come with me. We will give this to the king. Oh no, I don't know if I want to go because he might reject me again. Be not afraid. I myself will bring you. He says, okay. So they walk up together and then the king stands up because he sees the queen coming. And the queen and the little peasant walk up and he says, your majesty, this little peasant would like to present you with this in gratitude for all the things that thou hast done for him and his family in this kingdom. And the king looked. He says, I love apples. <laughs> Thank you. What a great, and actually I'm very hungry and I've been craving for apples. Thank you so much. And you, may your family be assured of my protection and I will take care of you. But you know what? It was the same exact apple, but repackaged in an extraordinary way. An amazing way she knew how to present it to her son. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, if we only gave ourselves to the Blessed Virgin, it's nothing obligatory by the church, but I would recommend many of us to consecrate ourselves through the methodology of St. Louis de Montfort, to consecrate ourselves totally to the Blessed Virgin. And if you do the preparation, you can do it with many, like the 33 days of glory, all that's okay. 
But make sure you go through the book, the book of true devotion, every day of your 33 days. Really read that book. Prepare from that book. And you will be so blessed. You will understand many things. You will be totally in the hands of the Blessed Virgin. I would like to recommend some devotions uh, to the Blessed Virgin. I would like to say a few of them. The Rosary. The first five Saturdays of the month recommended by Our Lady of Fatima. And the Brown Scapular. But before I do that, I would like to just emphasize the, the presence of the Blessed Virgin among us. She is bodily present as well. We just don't see her. And as we read in, today in the scriptures of the prophet Elias, you know, he, he didn't die. A chariot came and took him up to the heavens. Scripture says, so Elias never died. He's one of the rare men on the face of the earth that never died. We don't know where he is. And so analogously is the Blessed Virgin. She, she perhaps had the dormition, but if she did fall asleep, she immediately woke up back to life. The Lord took her away. He, she's not in the grave. Even if we were to gather an entire bus load of ditch diggers and we all take a bus to the airport and we fly all the way to the Holy Land and we cover the entire Holy Land with these ditch diggers and we dig two miles deep in the entire nation of the, of the Holy Land, I guarantee you we will not find one bone of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now, we may find some of her baby teeth, but that's about it. The one she lost as a little baby, a little kid. But you will not find a single bone of the Blessed Virgin. That should give us so much confidence. And she's powerful. She's the most powerful saint that there is. Imagine, without the Blessed Virgin, we will all be condemned to hell because she said yes. And therefore God came in the flesh to die on the cross so as to save us from hell. So we have so much to be grateful to the Blessed Virgin. We must be grateful to her. Now, the rosary is very, very important. Many times when I come across people who have so many crises in their lives or they don't know much about the faith or they might be our separated brethren just coming up to me asking me questions, I just try to leave them a rosary and try to teach them to say the rosary because I know that if this person falls into the hands of the Blessed Virgin somehow, he can't escape. He will find the way to where God wants that soul to go. The rosary is very powerful. Our Lady of Fatima came and she insisted that we pray the rosary, pray the rosary for the end of the war, the conversion of Russia, this and that and the other thing. Pray the rosary. Even when Sister Lucia went up there and she says, well, all these people are asking for cures. And the Blessed Mother, listen to this, she said once this, some will be cured, some no, but make sure they pray the rosary. And she said another time when she asked for some cures, this person will be cured if he prays the rosary during the month. The rosary is a powerful tool against the enemies of God, against secularism, against hedonism, against subjectivism, against materialism, against heresy. That's why the rosary was founded, because of heresy, against error. 
St. Dominic in the 13th century was called upon by the Pope to go and convert the Albigensians, Albigenians, those heretics in France. And so he went and he was like banging his head on a wall. He couldn't do anything with these people. So he went off to a forest and fasted for weeks and he beat himself with a whip and he prayed and begged the Blessed Mother to reveal to him how he can do it, accomplish his mission. And the Blessed Virgin appeared to him and she said, promote my rosary. The rosary in its primitive form was always there, right? The Hail Mary, etc. But this is the first time the official rosary that would be the greatest prayer now for now on for the Christian against the enemies of God. And St. Dominic received that rosary and he preached the rosary everywhere and he defeated those heretics. He converted so many of them back to the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church in honor of Our Lady and the glory of God. The rosary is powerful. We should pray it. And St. Louis de Moffat, in another little book he has, The Secret of the Rosary, when he, he gives a little introduction, he gives an introduction to priests, introduction to, to pious people, introduction to children, and he also gives an introduction to sinners. And watch this. He says, I believe and I would be willing to to write this down with my blood. He says, I truly believe anyone It doesn't matter if you already have one foot in hell. It doesn't even matter if you have surrendered your entire life to Satan and to the satanic cult. If that person prays fervently every day until his death the Holy Rosary, I promise you the Blessed Virgin will spare that person from eternal death. The Blessed Virgin will find a way to pull that soul from the grips of evil. So pray the rosary every day. Then the first five Saturdays in the month. So December 1925, Sister Lucia is already a nun, Hermana Lucia, or uh, Sister Lucia. And In her convent, she receives a vision from the Christ child and the Blessed Virgin. And he comes and he complains about uh, the sorrows of the Immaculate Heart. And this was a continuation of the 1917 apparitions in Fatima when she says, God sent me here to establish in the world Devotion to my Immaculate Heart. That's why that was the purpose of her, of her um, visions in Fatima, to establish this devotion to the Immaculate Heart. And so, why, why five first Saturdays to repair the five blasphemies committed daily against the Most Holy Blessed Virgin Mary? These blasphemies are the following. The blasphemy against her immaculate conception. There are many, so many Christians out there that do not believe that she's immaculate. They think she has sin. That's a blasphemy. To say that Mary has sin is a blasphemy. The second blasphemy is against the virginity of the Blessed Virgin. Those who say that she's not a perpetual virgin is a, is a blasphemy against the Blessed Virgin. And of course, anything against the Blessed Virgin is also against God. The blasphemy, thirdly, blasphemy against the maternity, the divine maternity and the, the 
the maternity of, uh, of all men. So those who deny that, who are against the divine maternity and the mother of all men, is a blasphemy. The fourth, those who cultivate hatred towards Mary Immaculate with little children, that's also a blasphemy. If we teach children to disdain her and to believe in all these errors about the Blessed Virgin, that's blasphemy. And lastly, the fifth blasphemy that we must repair is the damage that's done to her images. I remember when I was out west, there was a, a, a Protestant church for Spanish, because they always try to, they use all these Catholic terms. Aquí hay misa. You know, here there's mass, and they give all the mass time, but that's not mass. They're just trying to dupe all the, the Hispanics to come. And they kind of get them along for a while, make them all nice and happy there, clappy, nicey, happy, happy, happy. And then after a month, they put down uh, an image of Our Lady Guadalupe on the floor, and they tell them to come and stomp on her. And that's how they leave the faith, stomping on the most blessed Virgin Mary. It's a blasphemy. And the Blessed Virgin said, to those who do the first five Saturdays of the month in reparation to my Immaculate Heart, I promise that in the moment of death, all necessary for salvation will be for that soul. Those who did the first five Saturdays of the month. So if you do the first five Saturdays with, and it's approved by the church, the Portuguese bishop, bishops approved it long ago and then the Vatican accepted that so it's, a, it's, it's mainstream in the church. The first five Saturdays. And so, there's your ticket to heaven. <laughs> now don't say, okay, I'm going to do the first five Saturdays, guarantee my salvation, and then kill my mother-in-law. No, it doesn't work like that, no. <laughs> because you're premeditating something so that just scratches all the five Saturdays that you, that you would do. Believe me. <laughs> okay, it doesn't work like that. It has to be done out of love and humility to God and to the Blessed Virgin. So what are the conditions of keeping the first five Saturdays. So once you do the first five Saturdays, it has to be one first Saturday after the other. It can't skip anyone. You can't skip a Saturday. It has to be five in consecutive order. So if I start in February, March, April, May, June. If I miss one of those, I have to start over again. Okay. And once you get the first five Saturdays done, they're good for life. But hopefully we can do it all the first Saturdays, right? Because that's, that's will be even more consolation to the heart of the Blessed Virgin. So what are these four conditions to keeping these first five Saturdays of the month? The first thing is to confess your sins to a priest with the intention of repairing the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So, of course, you're asking God for forgiveness and so forth, but by doing that sacrament of confession, you offer up that sacrament received in reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, of those five blasphemies that constantly pierce her heart. Right? And then she clarified later, Sister Lucia, because she clarified, because people were asking does, it, does the confession have to be on that first Saturday or could it be a couple of days before, a couple of days after? Because, you know, sometimes there's no priest available. They just, they just don't have time or whatever. It's not in the schedule. So yes, Jesus says yes, it could be a couple of days before, a couple of days after, but not too much. Okay, but around that date. A little bit before, a little bit of after. Okay? To do the first, to do the confession. To confess your sins. 
but with the preference on that Saturday. That's, that'll be the preference if we could. And then the second condition is on that first Saturday of the month that you will receive Holy Communion on that day. And pretty much it has to be that day. Okay? And offer up that communion and reparation to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. You might say, well, well why am I going to be paying attention to Mary if I'm receiving Jesus? <laughs> well, you ever saw two brothers that are at each other's throats? And then finally they, they, they reconcile and they become the best of friends? What consolation there is to the heart of the mother, right? The mother is so consoled. So when we go to receive communion, we have crucified Christ. We hated Christ by our sins at one point. And now we're receiving him with love and devotion. That puts a great smile on the face and lips of the Blessed Virgin because she sees two sons united again, right? And so that's, that's why we can offer it up to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And then to recite at least uh, the, the, uh, to recite five mysteries of the Holy Rosary. Now, get this straight, because I didn't get it straight as a boy, and I lost, I had to do it older, when I was older, because I didn't do it correctly. So this is just, just the mysteries. This is not the meditation on the mysteries. It's only the, the decades of the Rosary. Okay. So this is a separate activity from the meditation on the mysteries that we're going to say in a minute. So that's when I, because I, I was combining the two of them. I was doing the rosary and the mysteries together, but not a two separate activities for this. I mean, obviously, every day of your rosary, you can meditate on the mysteries, no problem. But on this specific day, uh, the Blessed Mother asked, and Jesus asked for the uh, recitation of the five mysteries. You do those, all those Hail Marys and so forth. Do them fervently, reparation to the Immaculate Heart. And then as a separate activity, you will meditate on one or some of the mysteries of the Holy Rosary in your mind. Like meditate, mental prayer. You will think about them. You will think about how much Mary is suffering in such and such a mystery. And you'll have an attempt to try to console her heart by, by sharing your time with her there in the scene of some scene in the mystery. See? So you see how that works? So in that activity, 15 minutes meditating on one or some of the mysteries of the rosary. And then you offer that up in reparation to the Immaculate Heart. And then all the stuff we talked about yesterday, you got a ticket to go straight there. You will have a ticket to go. That's exciting, right? It's amazing. And that's why I would like to, you see, God is making it so easy in the moment, in the time that we're living in, the great apostasy that's breaking out everywhere in the world, the great crises in the world, great crises in the church, scandals galore, even within the church. God's going to make it really easy to try to scrape up as many souls as he can. If only we can teach our young people, high schoolers and young kids, to make those five Saturdays in a month, believe me, and do it with all they got. If they just did that, the Blessed Mother will watch over them somehow. You know how she is. She will take care of him. Might take a while. Might have to, you know, pull his ear. <laughs> She might get a little frustrated with him from time to time. But in the end, she will prevail. She will prevail over these minds and hearts of these confused young people. These young people who seem like they have no compass in life. They don't know where they're going. The Blessed Mother will take care of them. And if that wasn't enough, then we have the brown scapular. And she also showed the brown scapular in Fatima. In the last apparition, she showed up her brown scapular, appeared as Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Remember, at Our Lady of Lourdes, 
Bernadette, remember she saw, what was it, 15 times she saw the Blessed Virgin? I can't remember, 18 times, whatever she saw. I forgot the number exactly. But remember the last apparition? It was like in July, what's the feast day? July of, the, of Mount Carmel, uh, July 13th, is it? July 16th. And it was the last time she saw the Blessed Virgin before she entered the convent at Bernadette. And remember what she said? She, she looked at the Blessed Virgin and she was outside of herself. She said, I have never seen her so beautiful as this today. The Mount Carmel brings an extra beauty to the Blessed Virgin. And the Blessed Virgin was very beautiful when she was seeing her the other times, but she says she was just astoundingly more beautiful she ever saw her before. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, and there's reasons for that. The scapula. Remember Elias, the prophet, or as you say in your modern Bibles, Elijah. Elias. He was taken up in the chariot, just like the Blessed Virgin was taken up body and soul into the heavens. And what did Elias do? He left his garment on the ground, his mantle. And as soon as the disciple was to pick up that mantle, then Eliseus or Elisha had the same powers as his master. And so when we pick up the mantle of the Blessed Virgin and put it around our neck, the mantle, the cloth of the Blessed Virgin, blessed, blessed by a priest, there's a spe special ritual. Uh, before 1960, at least in the United States, I don't know about here, in the United States, First Communions, all the kids after First Holy Communion would be en enrolled into the scapular. I don't think they do that anymore. I, I'm hopefully, perhaps in this parish, yes, because you have such a wonderful parish. Uh, but this is, this is, these are the benefits to be enrolled into the scapular, to have the mantle, to have a piece of the cloth of, of the very clothes of Our Lady. Just like Elisha had Elijah's power. So it's scriptural. This is why we can have a, a, a cloth of a prophet or a prophetess or queen of heaven. It's biblical. It's from the book of Kings. And so the Blessed Virgin has left her mantle. And she's encouraging all of them to take that mantle. Now, now Mount Carmel is so symbolic with the same prophet Elias. Mount Carmel is a place of decision. Well, you have to make a decision. I'm going to follow God or I'm going to follow the world, the flesh, and the devil. Follow God or follow the false idols. And there's no in-betweens. That's the power of Mount Carmel in Holy Land. Because remember, Elias the prophet he looked at all those false prophets, hundreds of them. He was the only one faithful to God. And they wanted to kill Elias. But he says, wait, before we do all this stuff, let's see whose God is stronger, your false gods or the God of Israel. He says, you go first. So they put a bull on top of the altar of the false gods. And they began to pray that fire come and consume the victim in sacrifice. Calling upon these false gods and nothing was happening. And at least the prophet started to smile and chuckle. Ha ha, looks like your false gods are taking a nice siesta. Hmm, so much for your gods. And so the false prophet started to get angry and they started to to slit themselves with knives so as to appease the gods so that fire could be sent down and consume the sacrifice. Nothing happened. 
And then Elias was yawning. Oh, let's see what we can do here. <laughs> and he walks up and puts his own bull on top of the altar. And he says, wait, wait, I'm not going to do anything yet. Drench the bull with tons of water. <laughs> right? Like mocking the false prophets. Because he had to put the whole thing in fire and burn the whole thing to crisp. Dice it with water. And so they pour this whole river of water, just water everywhere. And all he says, send forth thy fire, O Lord. And two seconds, there was no longer a bull on top. It was just pure ashes. And then Elias the prophet slit all of their necks, all their throats, killed all the prophet, all the false prophets. God prevailed that day over the false gods. That's why Mount Carmel is so important in our spirituality of the church. And that's the whole meaning of the scapular, the brown scapular. Is because it's going to do in, it's going to do war with all the evil forces. It's going to have the power of God that Elias had, and that the Blessed Virgin has with her son. So the scapula was given to Saint Simon Stock, and the oh, I think it was the 12th century. I could be wrong on that, but they're in England. So he was a Carmelite. And the Carmelites were going through a, a, a mediocre period. They had a lot of problems, a lot of persecutions. They weren't doing the things they were supposed to do. And so this Simon Sock went off to the forest, just like our friend Dominic. He went out to a forest and started fasting, beating himself with whips, you know, and, and fasting for weeks in the forest, trying to ask for light for the Mount Carmel's order. And the Blessed Virgin appeared and, and gave him the brown scapular, the habit of the Carmelites, right? With this intention. And she made some promises there with it. My son, receive this scapular as a sign of the privilege that I have obtained for thee and for the children of Carmel. Whatever, whoever dies vested with this habit will, pre, will be preserved from the fires of hell. And it is a sign of salvation and it is a protection against the evil and dangers. And it is a sign of peace. And there are so many miracles, we won't have time to enumerate them. There are so many miracles uh, related to the brown scapular. For example, in 1845, there was a boat that was going from England to Ireland, or vice versa, I can't remember which. And they had a very violent storm. And the boat was in, in a danger of sinking and you had a, a Protestant minister with his family there, and they're all worried. And you had this young man from Ireland, he was Catholic, and the waves were brushing up against the boat, the, the thing was half sinking, people were, were, were fanatically screaming. And the young man pulled out his scapular from his neck and threw it into the ocean. And everything got calm immediately. 1845, a calm, immediate calm, just one more wave to come on a boat to give back the scapular. <laughs> and so the scapular came back on a boat. And that minister converted to the Catholic faith. His whole family converted to the Catholic faith, seeing that miracle of the brown scapular. And one thing more you should know about the brown scapular is the, the Sabbatine privilege. Don't forget about the Sabbatine privilege. People have downplayed the Sabbatine privilege, saying it never, never occurred, it doesn't exist anymore. 
but actually there's a scholar right now, I don't, I don't think the book's out yet, and I don't know where this person lives, but it's a lay woman, and she's writing a book about it, and she's proving that the Sabbatine privilege is, is part of the church tradition. And so <laughs> I think some people will be very uncomfortable about that if they hear it. And so what the Sabbatine privilege means is if you're enrolled in the scapula by a priest, so you have to be enrolled by the priest, you have a scapula, you're wearing a scapula, always wearing it. If you go take a shower, you can take it off for two minutes, that's fine. No? But get back into your scapula after, right? Make sure you always have your scapula on. You wear it with devotion and love. Um... And you have to live in your state of life, you have to live perfect chastity in your state of life. Whatever, if you're married, of course you're married. Or if you're priest, you're priest or whatever. So whoever you are, single, you have to live purity uh, the way your condition of life asks you to live perfectly according to God's will. And to do the divine, uh, the, the office of the Blessed Virgin. So enrolled, Wear it with devotion, perfect purity of your state of life, and then recite the office of the Blessed Virgin. If you do those things, you'll have the Sabbatine privilege. But Pope Leo XIII, in the late 19th century, because he knows that people don't, don't read the, the, uh, the, the, the Marian office anymore. <laughs> Nobody even knows that it exists, hardly. Uh, so he says you can replace that with the permission of your of your of your pastors. You know, uh, you can replace the office with the recit recitation of the rosary every day. So if you have that, if you die wearing the, with these conditions, you will go to heaven the next first Saturday of the month. <laughs> so pray that you die on the first Friday. Okay, so that you just have like a couple of hours, you know, just waiting, waiting to go to heaven. Okay, what a tremendous gift, right? So you, you want to do that type of thing. Okay, um, <clears throat> and how did this originate? It originated from Pope John the 22nd in 1322. He received a vision from the Blessed Virgin that told him about the Sabbatine privilege. So it was, it was about 80 years after the apparitions of St. Simon Stock. And the Blessed Virgin told the Pope that he is to promote this Sabbatine privilege connected with the brown scapular. And then he put out an urgent papal bull and it was confirmed by other popes as well, especially Pope Pius V, the great Saint Pope Pius V of the Council of Trent in those days, Pope Benedict XIV, I mean, big guns of papacy, promoting and approving uh, this devotion. So, if any of us are afraid of the fires of hell... <laughs> You just have to go with her. You have to become her child. You just become a child of Mary. Forget all this high flute and philosophy. Oh, my husband. Oh, I'm going to play a trick on him. No, you just become a child. And bring all your woes, all your crises to the Blessed Virgin day in and day out. Love the Blessed Virgin. And the Blessed Virgin will take care of you. And she will show you the way to Christ, always showing you to Christ. Those who are devoted to the Blessed Virgin, and one of the 15 promises of the Holy Rosary, right? There's 15 promises. Go look them up. Know about these 15 promises of the Rosary. One of them is they will be taken out of their errors and heresies. Anybody who's devoted to the Blessed Virgin, really devoted to her, praying that Rosary fervent, fervently, will always, sooner or later, will be pulled out of those errors and all those heresies that so many Catholics are infected with nowadays out there in the mainstream, right? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen.